Shalom and good morning to all of you on Church Online and on Facebook Live. Welcome to the English Online Worship Service of Georgetown Baptist Church. You know, indeed we, we can't be here physically, but, but you know, we thank God that, that He is enthroned on the praises of His people. Amen. Amen. So together, we're, we're going to lead all of us to worship our God through music and song today. You know, in Psalm 66, it says, Shout with joy to Come God, on. all yeah. the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Amen. Make His praises glorious. You know, this morning, let us raise our voices in praise to Him who is worthy of all our worship Amen. and this our adoration. Let us fill our homes with songs of praise and worship unto Him. Amen? Hallelujah. Come, let's praise the Lord. Come on, clap your hands with me. May our homes May our homes be filled with dancing May our streets be filled with joy May injustice bow to Jesus As the people turn and pray From the mountains from the mountains to the valleys, hear our praises rise to you. From the heavens to the nations, hear our singing, fill the air. Let our light shine in the darkness. May our light shine in the darkness. As we walk before the cross. May your glory fill the whole earth. As the water of the sea. From the mountains to the valleys, hear our praises rise to you. From the heavens to the nations, hear our singing, fill the air from the mountains, from the Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let's lift our voices. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Mountains, from the mountains to 
hear us singing. Fill the earth from the mountains, from the mountains to the valleys. Hear our praises rise to you from the heavens to the nations. Hear us singing. Fill the air. Hallelujah. Woo! Come on, church. Let's yeah. join creation. Praising Him. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't it great that God is faithful to see us through? Hallelujah. Let's worship Him. Oh, great is your faithfulness, oh God. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace, your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your grace. Great is your love. Great is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all the people sing along. Yeah. So remember, so remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace, your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough. children remember your promise oh god oh, lord remember your children remember your people remember your children remember your promise oh god let's make this prayer this church so remember your people Remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace, your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace 
Lord, we thank you, God, because you are a faithful God. Amen. Father, you are enthroned on high, O Lord, and yet, Lord, you, you are mindful of us, O God, every one of us, O Lord. You remember every one of us in our lowest estate, O God. Lord, we just want to give you thanks, O Lord. You are El Shaddai, O God. You are the God who supplies all our needs, Lord. And you are our provider, Jehovah Jireh. Lord, we thank you, God, in, in, in this pandemic, oh God, where everything in, in the world has changed, oh God. We thank you, God. We take comfort in the fact that you never change, oh God. Amen. We take comfort in the fact that you're still on the throne, oh God, over the flood, oh Lord. And we thank you, God, that you are the great I am, Lord. Who you were in the past, you are today, and you will be tomorrow, oh God. Father, we just want to thank you, God. Hallelujah. You are the ancient of days. You hold the beginning and the end, O oh Lord. Time is in your hands, O oh God. Praise you, Lord. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one King reigning over all, so I will not fear, for this truth remains that my God is the ancient of days. Let's sing it again, though the nations rage. rise and fall there is still one king reigning over all so I will not fear for this truth remains that my God is the ancient None above him, none above him, none before him, all of the time in his hands. For his throne it shall be remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in. Of days. Though the dread of night, though the dread of night overwhelms my soul, He is here with me, and I'm not alone. Oh, His love. Savior King, then my 
my joy calmly, standing face to face, though I'm not presence of the ancient of days. None above Him, none before Him, all of time in His hands. For His throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in His name. For my God is the ancient. None above him, none above him, none before him, all the time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in. glory into your household right now we're not just here to spectate we're not just here to watch from afar but we're here to worship the king who won us the victory today we're here to worship the one who gave all for us oh we worship you we worship victorious you. thank you god oh we worship you come on let's just spend a bit more time to welcome him in, we open up our hearts to you, King Jesus. Oh, we worship you, we worship you. You are victorious, Jesus. By his stripes, we are healed. Amen. By his nail pierced hands with free. Let's proclaim that today. By his blood we're washed clean. Now we have the victory. The power of sin. The power of sin is broken. Jesus overcame it all. Won our freedom, Jesus has won it all. Come on, all across this place with faith, let's sing. Hey. Hallelujah. Stripes, 
Shout of praise wherever you are. Hallelujah. Oh, we praise you, Lord. You reign and you reign. Hallelujah. Come on. Isn't it 
so good to worship our Saviour King. Thank you, Lord. You have won the victory for us. Thank you, Lord. I was just going through my quiet time this morning and I thank you, God, that that not a single one of your promises will ever fail. Not a single word from your mouth will ever fail. It will all come to pass because, you, God, God, you are a promise keeper. Yes. And God, in this season of COVID, in this season where we see a lot of opposition in politics, in, in racism, God, we just come against the spirit of despair right now. We come against the spirit of hopelessness and we declare over GBC that you are victorious, that you have won it all on the cross, that we need not fear. We need not fear the arrows that fly by day or the shadows by night. But Lord, if we look to you, if we look to you, that's where our help comes from. Thank you, Lord, you've won the victory for us. Thank you, Lord, that you are here. You are here for us. You, you are for us. You are not against us. Thank you, Lord, for choosing us as your sons and daughters. Thank you, Lord. We are so grateful, God, that even when we mess up and when we stumble and fall, you are there to pull us up again. Thank you, Lord, that wherever we are, we do not need to just be confined to a building, but even in our own homes right now, Lord, we ask for your presence to give us strength once more. Refresh our faith. Refresh our hope. Refresh us, God. And Lord, I declare for GBC that the best days are ahead of us. Yes. That our victories are coming. Yes. That our breakthroughs are coming. Yes. So God, we look to you in faith and we look to you in trust. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And everybody say, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Woo! So good. Thank you, everyone, for praising and worshipping with us. You know, we can't see anyone here. It's so weird. It's so awkward that I'm literally talking to chairs right now. But I know that online you are worshipping with us. And, you know, it's so good to, to just take a moment out of our busy week and just to come before God. In, in this spirit of worship and this spirit of joy and trust in Him. So we want to just take this time right now to welcome everyone who is joining us for the first time. Um, can we all just give a virtual clap on the chats on Facebook and on COP? All right, for all of those who are here with us for the first time, please don't feel awkward or like, oh gosh, what is this? Why are they clapping for me? Because we're so grateful that out of your busy schedule, you could literally be anywhere else on a Sunday, but you chose to be here with us online. So we thank you. Um, if you are here for the first time, and uh, you're joining this worship session for the first time, uh, could you just give us a shout in the chat, all right? Whether you're watching on Facebook Live or on COP, all right? Just comment something in the chat. Just say hello or what's up or selamat datang, all right? Or just put an emoji, a smiley emoji, also can, all right? And one of our friendly regulars will uh, be in touch with you, all right? We want to connect with you. We, we want to make you feel at home. Alright, so welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so grateful you're here. And for all our regulars joining online, welcome once more. Thank you for joining us. It's so good to worship together in unity, isn't it? Alright, so um, with that, as I give you time to just type on the chat and just greet one another and just say good morning to one another. Alright, um, I just have a couple of announcements to give. Um, very few this week. Um, first of all, you know, as we just finished our worship, you know, and where we're, we're singing to God that you've won the victory. Um, one of the ways that we can worship God is through our tithes and offering. So as we continue in this atmosphere of worship at home, you know, um, it says in the Bible, a couple of verses, that God loves a cheerful giver. And in another verse, it says that it's better to give than to receive, all right? This is, the, this is our way of saying, God, we trust you with our finance. We trust you with our money. And we, and we are grateful for what you've provided for us. So can I encourage everyone to come with that heart of giving, that heart of generosity. We thank you for your giving. Uh, the details are on the screen right now. All right, for your bank details, you can uh, quickly uh, take it down and you can pay it. Um, please don't feel compelled to give, all right? This is a matter of the heart. And uh, 
thank you so much for your generosity. And the second announcement that we have is prayer meeting will be on break this week. So we won't have prayer meeting uh, on Wednesday. Um, because of the Chinese New Year holiday. So we do want to wish everyone Happy Chinese New Year in advance. All right. Um, we hope that everyone can have a good time, whether it's online or whether you can visit your family, that you have a good time. Uh, and for those who are not celebrating Chinese New Year, um, Happy Holidays. Hope you have a good rest. All right. And we will see everyone in prayer meeting on the 17th, all right, which is the week after. On the 17th of February, we will resume our prayer meeting. All right. So everyone be blessed. Praise God for today. It's going to be an amazing day. Let's uh, head over to Pastor Yen Wat for our communion and our sermon for today. God bless everyone. Good morning, church. We're going to have our Holy Communion this morning. And I trust that you would have your elements, the cup and the bread, for yourself and for your family members. Can I have the first slide, please, on the Holy Communion? Yes, thank you. You know, one of the things about partaking of the Holy Communion is that uh, we do it on a monthly basis. And because of that, sometimes uh, we really lose the meaning and the awe of what it means to come before the Lord's table and, and really what it costs Jesus for us to be able to really partake of this communion with Him. Uh. And we know that the Lord Jesus instituted the Holy Communion on the night before he was betrayed. And in his very words recorded for us in Matthew chapter 26, and he said this, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body. And he says then he took the cup, and when he has given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, the first thing we need to really come back to the very basics about the Holy Communion and the Lord's Supper really is that the Lord went to the cross and it was broken for us. So he said, take it, this is my body which is broken for all believers. Then the second part is equally important and in many ways it is very important because it says here, this cup, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured for many. This represents, number one, it is the new covenant that he has instituted, that came into being well, from what he did on the cross. And really, this uh, covenant is about the forgiveness of sin that flowed from the cross. And we are reminded of that each time when we partake of the Holy communion. And then, reading from 1 Corinthians, can I have all the slides? 1 Corinthians, uh, yeah, chapter 11, reading from verse 23, and he says here, the Apostle Paul wrote this, he says, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whoever eats of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Here you see the Apostle Paul really quoting what the Lord Jesus said, but he, he added on something, something more. And it's a reminder to all of us that really when we partake of this Lord's Supper together, we are actually proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And really to die with him, that's what we always say, you know, uh, die with him and our sins are crucified on the cross with him. And then the last part is important and it says here, uh, that whoever takes of the bread and drinks of the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the Lord in the body and the blood of the Lord. And this is very serious. In other words, in other words, when we take of the cup, the elements and the bread, we really need to clear ourselves that anything that is not right between us and the Lord. And it is so important that we bring whatever, you know, iniquities, whatever we have done wrong, how we have sinned against the Lord, and clear that with Him before we partake of this. It is not to be 
partaken, to be taken in a light-hearted manner. It is solemn, it is serious, and therefore, we need to be reminded of this again. Huh? I want to give you just a few moments for us, all of you out there in your homes, just to bow our heads, close our eyes, just pause. I want to give you a few moments and to think of there are things that you have sinned against the Lord and sinned against fellow men and your brothers and sisters. And is there anything that you need to ask the Lord for forgiveness? Let's do that before we partake of the elements uh, because it's so important, reminded by the Apostle Paul. If we don't do that in an unworthy manner, the Apostle Paul says, we will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. I'll give you a few moments to do that. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he has given thanks, he said, this is my body which is given for you. Take it in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup and says, this cup is my blood in a new covenant. Drink it in remembrance of me. Come, let's pray before we partake of it together. Father, we want to thank you again and we want to be reminded again and again, each time when we come before the Lord's table and we partake of these elements, that we must partake of it in a worthy manner. Father, if there are anything that's hidden, there's darkness in us, help us, Lord, to, to release it to you. Shine your light that we may know, we may understand, and we may release it unto you. That when we partake of these elements, we will partake in a worthy manner. Father, because, Lord, you went to the cross you die for our sins. And Lord, it is something solemn, something serious. It costs you your life, that we may have life, life eternal. We are reminded again, Lord, that in this communion, when we partake of this together, we identify ourselves with you. And our sins are crucified with you on the cross, that on the day where it comes, we'll be raised again in righteousness by the blood of Christ. Thank you, Lord. And all this in Jesus' name. Can we take off the elements together, the bread? and the cup. Good morning to all of you again and uh, all of you who are viewing our online uh, via either Facebook or COP. Yeah. And uh, before I start, I just want to thank the worship team of Jason Farm and Matthew Tan for leading us in this morning's worship. Thank you very much. You know, uh, I really miss the live on-site uh, meeting together on a Sunday. Uh, it's really different than uh, just doing a recording and uh, you view it from home. But I, I trust that the Holy Spirit is present in all the homes and you will receive, receive the ministry of the Word and also in the worship and, and the Lord's presence will be strong in your homes. You know, in uh, 1871, much of uh, Chicago was on fire. And it was one of the great disasters of America in the 19th century. And one man, a very good friend of D.L. Moody, and a man of great faith, he had his house completely burnt to the ground, including his valuable assets. Despite the personal loss, you know, this man is really remarkable. In spite of his personal loss, and he didn't sulk. He didn't blame God. And he, in a sense, he wasn't sad for long. Instead, within a very short span of time, he and his wife and a family of four girls decided to just go out and help the other residents of Chicago to salvage whatever that they could find from the uh, debris, you know, from out of the fire. So he went around helping others while his house was also burnt to the ground in, in, in ruins. Then a few days later, he decided to follow D.L. Moody, he and his whole family, 
decided to follow D.L. Moody and to travel to England for Moody's evangelistic crusades. And what he did was he sent his family ahead of him, uh, his wife and four young daughters. And he planned to join them a bit later because he still has some uh, business to settle before he traveled. So as uh, those wife and the four daughters set sail uh, to England, and somewhere in the mid-Atlantic Ocean, the ship collided with another ship. And his wife and the four daughters were thrown into the Atlantic Ocean. And his wife was rescued, but his four daughters drowned and died. And obviously, this man was very crushed. Then he decided that the time that day was right, he, once, he went on the ship to join his wife, who was rescued and found in England, waiting for him. So as he was on that ship traveling to England, and when he reached that spot where the accident took place, where his four daughters drowned, he went to the deck, and the captain of the ship showed him, this is the spot where your four daughters drowned. And as he looked into the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, it was black, huh? and... Uh, and obviously, he cried. Emotions overcame him. But it wasn't for long. And immediately after that, there was this joy that surged within him. Somehow, he cannot explain it. And there was this tune and this song that came to him. And he quickly went back to his cabin and he wrote down the, the, the words that came to him. And, and thereby, he composed his song. The name of the song is... It is well with my soul. Can I have the first slide, please? And this man is Horatio Spafford. And the composer of the song, It is well with my soul. It's a very uh, well-known hymn. And uh, he said this. He says that I am glad to be able to trust my Lord when it costs me something. Now, I, when I read this, I began to wonder, you know, how could a man who has just lost four little girls, young girls, and praise God and compose a song to praise Him and to worship Him? How could he ever get such strength from a disaster like this? How could Horatio Spafford find the joy to live his life to the fullest? You know, um, Mother Teresa said this. He says a joyful heart is a normal result of a heart burning with love. And how true it is. Because Horatio Spafford was a man that certainly did have a lot of love for people. He sacrificed much helping the people of Chicago at a time when he also uh, had experienced personal loss as well. You know, joy is an important character trait of a Christian. I have this on the slide for you. Joy is an important character trait of a Christian because out of the love of Christ and the love that flows out from Christ and as recipients of that love, it is joy. You know, when we have finished reading the Bible, when you have finished the reading of the Bible uh, from cover to cover and I, I trust that you would have uh, if you have been a believer for at least one year because that's all it actually takes. Just one year, if you are disciplined in reading the scriptures, the Bible, you would have been able to finish it. So when you're finished reading the Bible from cover to cover, there must be one burning question that you need to ask. That what is the end game of that one story in the Bible? It seems obvious, but I'm sure if I were to ask you, Different people would give me different answers to that question. Now, what is that one end game of the Bible? At the end of time, when, when the, the everything comes to an end, you know, the, the, the age of the church comes to an end, what is that the end game? What is the end thing at the end of it all? And some people will say that Satan is bound. Hallelujah, that's wonderful. Evil is defeated once and for all completely 
And that's wonderful. We all rejoice. And Jesus reigns. Yes, we all rejoice. And believers will reign with Christ. And ultimately, yes, hallelujah, we all rejoice. You know, after all that happens, after the end of the church age, after the end of humanity, the end of this life for everyone, what is that one word that best describes the end game for believers? We all know that Satan is bound, evil is defeated completely once and for all. We know that Jesus reigns. We know that there's no more pain. Uh, there's no more suffering. We know that there's no more deception. We know that at the end of the day, believers will reign with Jesus. But what is that one word, if I would ask you for one word that would describe the emotion at the end of it all? That one word is celebration. Richard Foster says it rightly when he says that celebration is at the heart of the way of Christ. And celebration flows out of the deep-seated joy in all believers. However, we don't have to wait until the end of age, the end of time, the end of the church age, before we begin to celebrate, to have joy. Because joy is an integral part of who we are as believers in Christ. It, is, it flows out of the, of the deep-seated joy in Christ. And out of that flows out joy. And people around us will be able to see and experience and understand the joy that flows out from us. And this morning, I'm going to speak on finding joy in a joyless season. You know, the Bible is full of verses on joy and celebration. They are not just as meant to be descriptive, but they are actually normative behavior and character of the people of God. You know, in other words, when you read the verses on joy and celebration in the scriptures, you, those verses are not meant to describe how a believer should behave. Yes, it does. Yes, it does describe uh, how a believer should behave. Yes, it does describe certain circumstances where believers celebrate. But more importantly, it also conveys a very important message to us that joy is actually normative behavior. In other words, it is a norm. It is, it is naturally the norm. It is naturally, uh, the joy is natural in every believer. And it is an important character trait of the people of God. But really, at the end of the day, do we, do believers behave and live our lives with joy and celebration and with this vision of the end game in mind, especially in this season? Do we really live out our joy, uh, our life with joy as we should because it is normative behavior? You know, a German philosopher by the name of... Uh, Frederick Nietzsche, and uh, he said this. He says, I would believe in their salvation if they looked a little more like people who have been saved. You know, when you read a, a sentence like this, you know what an indictment of believers and of the church. And he says, I would believe in their salvation if their salvation is so important to them. There must be a lot of joy. What he's saying there, I don't see that in believers. And when I see that in believers, I would believe more in their salvation, in, in the gospel, in what they are telling people and telling me. If only the people of God would say more hallelujahs, if we would rejoice more rather than greeting people with sighs and with sad faces, and really, at the end of the day, do, do we go out and exemplify that, that joy in, in our language, in our deeds, in our persona? Do we actually do that? You know? And I was just thinking that, you know, uh, perhaps the Christian, uh, when you send out emoticons and emojis, uh, we must change. Uh, we should be sending uh, emojis like this, emoticons like this. You know, you notice the second uh, last one from from your right of the screen, even when you are sweating over some issues, you should also be smiling. 
Depicting joy, even in the midst of challenges. And you should never send emojis are like that. That is really no good. It is not reflective of what a believer uh, should behave, should be like. Because joy, let me remind everyone again, joy is really normative behavior. You know, someone once said, I, I read it somewhere, that you, there are some believers, you can't even get a single shout of hallelujah from them, even if you were to squeeze them through a juicer. Wow. You know, when you squeeze some people, believers, through a juicer, you cannot even get some juice of joy out of them. You know, Nicky Gamble, in his book, The Jesus Lifestyle, and he said that one of the mistaken views of some believers is that there should be no smiling and laughing in church. And that is wrong. That is certainly wrong. When we look at what's happening around us in the world at this nation, yes, we feel that we have little reason to rejoice, and that's very true. And any celebration may seem to be hollow, may seem to trivialize the suffering that many people are really going through in this season. You know, the pandemic, the economy, the violence, the racism, uh, evil in many forms, and for some health and personal issues, not just in Malaysia, but around the world as well. But understand this, our joy is rooted in Jesus and His grace and mercy and not dependent on circumstances. And that is the reason for our celebration. No other reason. Yes, we do grieve for people, we do grieve for circumstances, we do grieve for situations, but that shouldn't squeeze the joy of the Lord out of us. There will be pensive moments, but there should also and always be a steadfastness, a steadiness in the way we go about our lives. Because joy of the Lord is our strength. It will undergird whatever that we do, how we feel. Ultimately, yes, like Spef, uh, Horatio Spafford, well, he felt the grief when he looked into the black waters of the Atlantic Ocean, but for a fleeting moment, and suddenly joy welled up because he says, all is well with my soul. What are we joyful for? I'm going to look at some of these uh, uh, answers to this question as we move along. We are joyful for, number one, victories, breakthroughs, and blessings. <clears throat> Let me read for you a couple of verses, a few verses taken from 2 Samuel chapter 6, reading from verse 12. And here it says, So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and sound of trumpets. You know, this is a very familiar passage to many of you, I trust it is so. And if you are familiar with this passage, you, you must understand the background, you would know the background. And you need to understand the background to, to understand the context of this celebration. In the earlier chapter, in chapter 5, David had defeated the powerful Philistines and successfully reclaimed the ark and brought them back to Jerusalem. He had inquired of the Lord. In fact, before he entered the battle, he asked of the Lord what he should do and, and how he should battle the Philistines. And the Lord's hand was with him and his men and they could defeat the powerful Philistines. So it was a great occasion to celebrate. The ark was finally back to Jerusalem and be placed in a temple where it belongs. Now, we must understand something. For the Israelites at that point in time, in particular, the ark was everything to them. The ark represents uh, God's favor, God's presence, God's dwelling with them. And when you have the ark being taken away from them by the Philistines earlier, it was like a part of their soul being taken away. That's how important it was. It was so important that the ark must be placed in the temple because it represents that it's very core of, of the religious belief of the community, of the 
people of God, the Israelites. You know, it was all that it was so important to them because it also signifies that God's presence with them and God's favor was with them. So it was really a time of celebration. Imagine those t- period where the ark was taken away from the Philistines and it was, it was really emptiness all around. Perhaps the feeling is like being locked down uh, currently, like what we are feeling at the moment. So there, was, there must have been emptiness all around when the ark was taken away by the enemy and the powerful Philistines. So imagine when eventually the Lord helped them show favour upon them and help them to bring the ark back. It was an occasion for a great celebration. And not only were they able to bring the ark back, it was a sign that the Lord had showed them favour and really maybe forgiven them for whatever sins and iniquities. And now they have a relationship back with Yahweh. It was a release of unrestrained joy in the Lord. And within the context, as I say, of the Old Testament he break religious culture. This is absolutely important. Eh? That this joy, this celebration before the Lord is a reflection of thankfulness. Thanking the Lord that his favour is again upon them. That he has helped them to bring back an, an integral part of what it means to be an Israelite. And of divine goodness and ultimately the favour of the Lord, the presence of the Lord is with them. The favour of the Lord rests with the righteous and brings joy as we experience victory, breakthroughs and blessings. You know, uh, in Proverbs, you said here, the prospect or the hope, uh, the literal translation here is actually hope, of the righteous is joy. The hope of the righteous is joy. But the hopes or the expectations of the wicked come to nothing. Why? Because the favour of the Lord rests with the people whom the Lord blesses, whom the people, where the people will experience breakthroughs. And this is where it is a sign of the favour of the Lord. And therefore, when the favour of the Lord is upon the people, then there is joy, there is celebration. So we rejoice when the Lord gave us victories, blessings and breakthroughs. And in three areas, the first one is a breakthrough in illness. I'm going to talk about three broad areas One is that blessing and breakthrough in illness. And here I'm not just talking about major illness and you recover from that. And I'm I'm also referring to some very minor, the the minor ailments that you recover from. We should always spend time thanking the Lord because it is a blessing. I remember in uh, December 2019, that year during Christmas, we had a big Christmas play. And uh, it, it was really very challenging to put all that together. Uh, the play itself, the cast, and we have a big team that worked on it. And uh, that was also that period we were really very short of time. Within that few weeks, we got to have rehearsals, practices, and, and I had to really uh, work out together with the team how to come up with the props and how to change the props. And it is not an easy thing because we have to change the props. We make sure that we can change it within 30 seconds to a minute. And how to really put them together and all that, design it, and many things to do. So we were really rushing, and uh, about 10 days before Christmas, I came down with viral fever. And this viral fever just won't go off. Uh, I was on paracetamol and uh, daily, and it just won't go off. And my fever would be around 38, 38.5. Uh, certain days it went to 39, and that's, that's pretty high fever. So I was really feeling bad, and I was really feeling under the weather, and there was really a lack of energy, but yet I had to come and, uh, for the practices and, and to see that certain things are being done and all that. And I remember it went on day after day, and I was really struggling. And on about two days before Christmas, I came to the point where I said to the Lord, Lord, I can't take this anymore. If I'm going to have this fever continue all the way to Christmas, I'm going to have a problem. Because on Christmas Day itself, I'm going to come here, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, be the one that, that is going to uh, run the thing, I'm going to be the one that's going to introduce, I'm going to be the one that's going to be up here and to challenge the people and all that. So I, I, I cannot do it. I told the Lord and I have to, be, uh, to have that joy 
And when you are so much under the weather, I, I struggle. And you know what? On that Christmas day itself, my fever broke. Ten full days. I do not know why the Lord kept this uh, viral fever in me for ten full days. And on the Christmas morning itself, when I woke up, the fever broke. And then I really celebrated because I knew really it was the Lord's hand that actually took away that fever. So when you have breakthroughs like that, even if it's just viral fever, it's not something major, but yet we celebrate because the Lord has seen us through that and has seen me through that. And there are spiritual breakthroughs, the second category, and I'm sure many of you would have experienced this as well. I, I do remember many of my uh, spiritual milestones. In fact, I've kept a journal, a diary for the last 25 years. And one of the things I enjoyed most in my quiet time is to go through the history, look through my diary over the 25 years. And you know, and then I would begin to see those spiritual breakthroughs. And I spent time thanking the Lord for those breakthroughs over the last 25 years. And I think you should do that as well. I want to encourage you, those of you who do not keep journals, it's good to start journaling now. You're, you're traveling your journey with the Lord, and then especially when there are spiritual milestones, you note it down so that you can come back, reflect on it, and praise God for that spiritual breakthrough. Blessings, I'm sure many of us have experienced uh, blessings, some measure of the Lord's blessings in various forms in our journey. Uh, we rejoice with our uh, you know, career, in our family, in our finances, whatever that the Lord has blessed us with. And these are the victories and breakthroughs and blessings that we should always celebrate and, and be reminded again and again. This is the reason. These are one of the reasons as to why we are joyful. The second reason as to why we are joyful, what should we be joyful for, is who God is. You know, the world looks at happiness and joy in money, fame, achievements, adoration of people. Yep, you look at some of the celebrities, I read that in this season, many of them are feeling depressed. Why? Because they miss the stage. They miss their fans screaming at them. They miss the adoration of their fans. And they find that once all those things are taken away from them, there is no more the joy, you know, they went into a depression. And they feel very depressive about it because they don't have the stage anymore. And because they find joy and happiness in the adoration of people, there are others who find joy and happiness in their career, while others will find joy in shopping, and others traveling, while yet others will find joy in eating and feasting. But you know what? Jesus demolished, destroyed all these myths of the route to happiness and to joy. Completely destroyed all this. In his teaching in the Beatitudes. I have it up for you on the screen here. Just a few verses here on the Beatitudes. It says here, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You know, the word blessed in the New Testament Greek, and it appears nine times in the first 11 verses or so, the literal translation of that word in Greek, or rather the Greek word is makarios. And makarios, the literal translation into English is happy. It is happy. And here he says that happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are the meek. Happy are those who thirst and hunger for righteousness. Now, it begs this question. When you read things like that, now, you, we must ask this question. Why are the poor happy in spirit? Why are those who mourn happy? Why are the meek happy? Why are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness happy? What reasons do they have to be happy? They are poor in spirit. They mourn. They are meek. They, they hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
These are not the people who has lots of money. They are not the people who are famous. They are not the category of people where they have achieved much by the world standard. They are not the group of people whereby they have lost thousands and thousands of adoring fans. They are not the type of people or may not be the type of people who get to go shopping very often. They may not be the type of people who get to eat buffet uh, dinners every day. You know, what reasons then do they have to be happy and joyful? What reasons can they be happy and joyful? Well, Jesus said, they're happy because they belong to the kingdom of God. He says they're happy because they will be comforted and they are happy because they inherit the earth and they will be filled. Now, how is all that even possible? How can they inherit the kingdom of God, be comforted and inherit the earth and be filled? How would that even be possible without money, without power, without influence, without cleverness? How would that even be possible at all? And why would belonging to the kingdom of God be comforted by the Lord Inherit the earth, make us happy. How would that make us happy? Uh, these are the questions we need to ask. And we will be filled with what? And how would that make me happy? Filled with what? And how would that make me happy? The short answer to it all is that because of who God is and what Jesus has done on the cross, period. Now, church, I want you all to hear this. Hear this carefully. There is nothing, no amount of money, no deeds, no power, no influence, no highest office on earth that has caused such a seismic shift from despair and hopelessness of men to a new hope and a new joy beyond what we can imagine through the work of the cross. Let me say that again. There is nothing, no amount of money, no deeds, no power, no influence, no highest office on earth that has caused such a seismic shift from despair and hopelessness of men to a new hope and a new joy beyond what we can imagine through the work of the cross. The reality of the cross is like waking up to a fresh new morning after a bad nightmare the night before. That is the new reality for everyone who encounters a cross. It is an experience like no other. You know, church, I want to say this. I am not exaggerating, but I am articulating the truth with conviction of the power of of the seismic shift for people who encounter a cross in their heart, in their spirit. There is a seismic shift. Unless, unless, unless you don't feel the weight of your hopelessness, unless you are in denial and think that you can navigate all of your life's problems with your cleverness, and unless you believe and you are deceived to think that you are good enough. You are good enough to meet God's standards of holiness and righteousness. Unless you belong to any of these three categories of people, then the cross will mean nothing to you. And who God is will not matter to you. But the reality of the matter is that the cross is the single most important, life-changing I want to emphasize this term again. Seismic shift. A seismic shift and the greatest story for all humanity. The cross brought much agony to Jesus. And, and true enough, it really, Jesus suffered and he died for us. But it brought much joy and reasons to celebrate for those who encountered the cross. Without the cross, all of us are in trouble. Without the cross, all our achievements, all our cleverness, all our hard work, and even goodness and good deeds, they count for nothing. Without the cross, 
life on earth would be thoroughly meaningless, especially right now. I believe many people across the world find life so meaningless, locked home, can't do many things that they would love to do. And really, it becomes very empty. Without the cross, this pandemic would overwhelm us. And many people are being overwhelmed. And I hope none, no believers are being overwhelmed. But I do know there are some. Even believers are overwhelmed. I will deal with that. I will talk about that in a moment. Without the cross, the spin-offs from the pandemic, the economic downturn, the emotional and mental stress from lockdowns, the concerns for our family, and the future of our young children will be too overwhelming to handle. And really, without the cross, when I look at what's going on around the world, Malaysia, right here in Penang, and all over the place, I look at the pandemic, there's no end in sight. I look at the church lockdown, we can't come back to worship. I look at many other issues. I look at families uh, with young children and don't know what schooling will be like. They probably have lost two years. They have already lost two years of schooling. It will be two years at least. And I won't be surprised it will go on to 2022 as well. Uh, I, I, I'm really not very optimistic about how the pandemic will pan out. Um, and these are the things that we have to be prepared for. Without the cross, I would be overwhelmed. Without the cross, I know many of you, many of you would be overwhelmed as well. Therefore, we are joyous. Why? Because we have the cross. We have a new hope. We have fresh hope. We know that we belong to the kingdom of God. We know that we will be comforted. We know that we will inherit the earth. And we know that we will be filled and not go hungry because of who God is and because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Now, why do we need to remain joyful? Why do we need to remain joyful? And we are not called to just be, to be joy, joyful in fleeting moments. Suddenly there's a reason to celebrate. Oh, you're so happy. And then just after that, you're overwhelmed by the concerns of the world, by what's going on. And only in fleeting moments that you are joyful. That should not be the way. We are called to be joyful throughout our lives because joy is an integral part of the DNA of a believer. And therefore, joy should be uh, very much a part of our lives all the way. So, why do we need to be joyful? Number one, <clears throat> joy defeats the work of darkness. Let me share an actual example with you. It happened some uh, years ago in the 1990s, in mid-1990s. I can't remember the exact date, uh, the exact year. There was a seminar which was held in that time we were in number 14. It was a night seminar. I can't even remember who was the speaker. Uh, at the end of the seminar during the ministry time, laughter broke out in church, in the congregation. Those of you who were there, if you remember, laughter broke out. People were laughing and then almost everybody was either on the floor or they were flat on the pews, you know, laughing away, laughing at nothing. And I was there, I, I was right behind the uh, sanctuary. I stood there, I remember I folded my arms, I was looking at them. Now, must remember, in the 1990s, mid-1990s, I've had very little experiences with uh, some of the works of the Holy Spirit. I was just recently, you know, uh, previous, before that incident, I, was, uh, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I received tongues. It was, I think it was about a year uh, earlier. And then I, I was very new to all this. And I was quite close to this, although I was trying to keep an open mind. So I stood there. I folded my arms. I, I, I looked at those people. What are they doing? You know, laughing at nothing and going on the ground. What's happening? This like a kind of hysterical thing, outbreak. I said, cannot be happening in church. I was... Looking at them, I was wondering what is happening. I know nothing about it. And I remember Ban Singh was also with me. 
Yeah, but but Singh will remember the incident. We spoke about it. Uh, I think some time ago also. So I believe Ban Singh will have felt the same thing. And then I remember seeing Ban Singh walking up down the pew towards the front. And as he reached the middle portion, there were two American ladies who was laughing away. These two American ladies, they were actually in their fifties. They were they were missionaries. You know, they, uh, they, they were missionaries and uh, they had been GBC for a couple of years. And uh, they were all laughing. They, they were proper people, very proper. They are not those uh, self self type, very proper. And then, but they were laughing away. They were on the ground, on the floor, and all that. And then, as Ban Seng walked past them, one of the ladies touched Ban Seng on the shoulder. And Ban Seng burst out laughing. Burst out laughing, laughing at nothing. And he went onto the floor. He was down on the floor laughing away. So I said, Ah, joy, this Ban Seng also like that now. What has become of us? So I, I decided to walk there to investigate. As I walked there, Ban Seng got off a view. He touched me on one shoulder and the other American lady touched me on the other shoulder. And wow, immediately I burst out laughing. I went right into the floor. There was this torrents, you know, waves and waves of... It was, my stomach was churning, the deep inner center of being. It was, it was, it was just churning and I just came out laughing. I, I was trying to stop... I was trying to do this, but I couldn't because it was laughing. It was like a lot of this air get coming out. I, I couldn't explain it. There was so much joy and I was laughing at nothing. I was trying to control myself, get up. I went down again and I was laughing. You know, I, after all this ended, um, I went back home and asked the Lord this. I said, Lord, why did you have to do this? Is it necessary to laugh like that in church? I, I asked the Lord, and the Lord said this to me. This is exactly what he said. I noted down in my journal, he said this. I need to bring back the joy to my people. I need to bring back the joy to my people. Now, you may under, not understand this, uh, the, the full impact of this, but let, let, me, let me just quickly give you a back, bit of background. I cannot go into the details. It's a long time. We, I really don't want to talk about it. Uh, at that time, GBC was going through some issues. Uh, there was a spiritual heaviness over the church. Those of you who have been in GBC uh, in the 90s, you would have understood what I said. There was a spiritual heaviness. It was one or two years at least. Spiritual heaviness over the church. There was really no joy. We were just going about doing our work doing ministry. It's like, a, it's a, like a routine kind of activity. We, we have to do it. So we were going around doing it. And then the Lord gave us a breakthrough. It was right in the middle of the season. And the Lord said, I need to bring back the joy to my people. And immediately, immediately, I could connect. I understood. Immediately, I understood why the Lord had brought this spirit of laughter that night. And the Lord Said, went on to say, I want my people to laugh. And I want my people to laugh, number one, as a rebuke to the work of darkness. Obviously, there was a work of darkness in that couple of seasons. There was a spirit heaviness. It was meant to depress, cause depression for people. And there was no more joy in serving and doing some things. But Lord said, I want my people to laugh as a rebuke to the work of darkness. The devil will always seek to bring God's people to despair and de depression. I tell you something, church. The antithesis to the work of the devil is joy. Joy is the antithesis to darkness and despair. You know, in Psalm 27, 6, it says, Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me, at his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. <clears throat> Scholars believe that when David wrote this psalm, uh, he, was, he has not yet ascended to the throne. He was at that time still serving in the courts of Saul. And at that time, we know that he, he went through uh, a lot of uh, accusations, uh, challenges, persecution from within and he knows that his enemies, although they are mortals, was actually the kingdom of darkness at work in these people. 
So he knows. And uh, David wrote this psalm and he, while he was serving and he knew that his battle was not against people but against a kingdom of darkness at work in these people. So his strategy, David's strategy, was to stay close to the Lord and make sacrifices with shouts of joy and sing and make music. And that was his strategy. And likewise, you know, uh, in times, you know, during that season, I was personally affected as well uh, because I also have also been accused of some things from within the church. I, I, was, I was already in the leadership. And it's really not nice when uh, the person who accused me is a really a close friend. And because of that, I, I was also very, uh, I was feeling down, I was in despair. But that night, that night, the Lord made me laugh. And he told me later that night, I want you to laugh, to laugh at the enemy. And I laughed. I'll tell you this, it is so important. It is so uh, therapeutic. It is so good for the spirit. And, and really, I believe there is a spiritual dimension to it. There's a spiritual significance to it. As you laugh out in the physical, something happens in the spiritual. So as in worship, Joyful celebration rattles the demonic world. The demonic cannot stand in the presence of God's people celebrating because celebration glorifies God and honors Him. It brings in God's presence and glory. And the next thing is, and the church, for the church to rise above the issue. Firstly, remain joyful because joy defeats the work of darkness as a rebuke to the work of darkness and for the church to rise above the issue. Joy was then and will always be an awesome antidote to spiritual heaviness. L let me be clear about an issue here. Uh, let me be very clear about this. Huh? Never try to manufacture anything. It will not bring glory to God. Don't force a laugh out. Wow, today I'm feeling spiritually depressed. I'm very depressed. It's heavy there, so I laugh. Ha, 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 ha. You know, I'm trying to manufacture that. Don't try to manufacture anything because it will, not, it will not give God the glory besides making you look silly. Don't ever try to do that. At the same time, don't stifle anything that's from the Holy Spirit because it will only grieve the Holy Spirit. So allow the Holy Spirit to do His work. Allow the Holy Spirit to be the Holy Spirit doing His work. Don't try to manufacture anything and don't stifle it at the same time. Next thing is, spirit of joy lives our spirit and our faith. I'll give you three verses here very quickly uh, from Psalm 47. One, clap your hands, all you nations, shout to the Lord with cries of joy. And 97, some, the Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. And Psalm 49 says, let Israel rejoice in their maker, let the people of Zion be glad in their king. There are many verses in Psalms that speak about rejoicing. You know, in fact, Psalms 90 to 150 are known as exalted Psalms, and they are very uplifting uh, for the spirit sets our spirit rejoicing and lifts our spirit. Let me come to the final part. How do we remain joyful? Very straightforward. It's not rocket science. It's not nuclear physics. Very straightforward. How do we remain joyful? Number one, keep our focus on Jesus and not on our circumstances. Keep our eyes on Jesus, focus on Jesus, and keep the main things the main things. Don't allow the peripheral issues to so affect us. You know, so often, sometimes we wrestle over very peripheral issues. Just keep them to the main thing and what you're doing. And of course, unless the peripheral issues are encouraging, they bring you much joy, they, they motivate you, uh, they give glory to God, that's fine. But if the peripheral things are the ones that cause you to be depressed, then just keep your focus on the main thing, on the mission of God that the Lord has set upon in your heart and unto GBC. Just keep the main thing. Keep our focus on Jesus and don't look around and be distracted by the circumstances around us. And number two, keep our spiritual discipline. <clears throat> Let's keep our spiritual disciplines, reading the Bible, keeping the quiet time, meditation, prayer, talking to the Lord in solitude with the Lord. 
remember this. An idle mind is a workshop for the devil. So in a time like this, when you have all the time locked in at home, of course some of you are work from home, la. you are not that free, but for the rest of uh, you, if you have some time, please don't, don't have an idle mind and start to think of things. You know, the, the thing with our mind is when we start to allow it to wander, very often it wanders into things that are not so nice. Into, into conflicts, into issues, into people you don't like, into circumstances you despise, into bosses you don't like, into everything else. That, that is the nature of the fallen state of our mind. Our mind will not naturally wander into the things that bring God glory. So therefore, we should keep, therefore we should actually keep our spiritual disciplines and then read the Bible, pray, you know, and, and do not allow your mind to wander into those things unless your mind is one, you are so consecrated, your mind will only wander into the things of the glory of God, of the holiness of God. Then go ahead, continue to wander if that's you. Huh? <clears throat> and the next one is start serving. It is, serving is, is a very powerful way to, to, to really find meaning and purpose. You know, when you find meaning and purpose in your life, you're going to find joy. Instead of staying idle and twiddling your thumb, you know what's twiddling your thumb? This is twiddling your thumb, right? Instead of staying idle and twiddling your thumb, and start to allow your problems to overwhelm you, start doing something, something that can make a difference to other people's life, even in this lockdown. In fact, all the more in this lockdown, primarily because you have the time. Call someone to check on them. Call or text each other. Pray over the phone. Share with someone what the Lord has been saying to you and pray for one another. Look for open windows or opportunity to share with Christ. A phone call, a text, WhatsApp, or now you use Signal, whatever. Send someone a text and says, how can I pray for you? You know, I, I have some free time. Uh, can, can you, do you have anything that I can pray for you? Wow, I tell you, that would be wonderful. And you pray. As that person texts back, you know, this is what I'm going through right now. Can you pray with me, for me? Let me pull all this together. I believe there are some impediments to being joyful. <clears throat> Number one, it can be our character and our upbringing. We may experience difficulty, you know, in grow up, in the grow up years, in our family and the circumstances around us. Um, we, we may have gone through a lot in our growing up years. And therefore, it's really so ingrained into us, you know. And we, we can't find joy. Joy just cannot break out. Because it's not something you, you experience joy in your family in your growing up years. The second reason could be it's so ingrained in us that God is serious. You know, being a believer is heavy stuff. And church is solemn and serious business. Clearly, we need to be serious. No doubt about it. We need to be serious in our walk with God. We have to be serious and solemn in our repentance, in our iniquities, where we are straight away. We have to be serious and solemn. We, we, there's nothing to be joyful about sins. We have to be, uh, that repentance, spirit of repentance calls for us being solemn. However, God is not a killjoy. He is indeed a God of celebrations, a God of joy. While I do understand that some are naturally more exuberant, yeah, some people are more exuberant naturally, uh, while others are more solemn in personality. But nonetheless, a solemn personality can also be joyful without being overly clear to people. You can also have that peace and joy in you. You don't have to have an exuberant character. It helps an exuberant person. You know, I like to be around an exuberant person because the joy rubs onto me and I hope that I can also rub the joy onto people as well. It is important. You know, we need to be aware that our personality rubs onto people one way or the other. And people in the marketplace, they are watching us. You know, uh, I once read this interesting quote. Someone wrote this, he says, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who cause happiness wherever they go. And yet, 
they are those who cause happiness wherever they go. I hope we all belong to the first category and be effective witnesses to the watching world. I hope we will be more exuberant in our personality and uh, yeah, be able to really show that joy. And your joy is not trivializing people's suffering. Eh? And people share with you their suffering, say, ah, nothing about it. Ah. And you laugh over it. That is not right. right? That is trivializing uh, someone's suffering. That is not right. right. Yes, there's a place to show concern. Yes, to pray. There are also many occasions where you can show a peace and the joy, which is an integral part of the DNA of a believer. We have to be an effective witness to a watching world, as I said. And really, the end game of faith is Jesus. You know, end game is always about Jesus. And the end game of our faith in Jesus is a resurrection of believers, not a burial. It is a festival and a marriage, not a funeral. So let's go out, church, and not carry that kind of persona with us as if we are perpetually going to a funeral. It is a celebration, it is a festival, it is a marriage. So we have every reason to be joyful because we know the end game. And even right now, we know the devil and the darkness is defeated. The pandemic will go off at some point. It will. But while it is here, we are asked to go through with it, manage it, and yet be joyful because we know the Lord will see us through. I am confident we stay with the Lord, the Lord will see us through. And so, we have a reason to be joyful, even in this season where, there's, uh, where the world at large, people at large, the people who do not know Jesus are in despair. As I, as I close, uh, before I pass this time to the worship team, I, I just want to throw this challenge before I pray for all of you. You know, there are three categories of people I, I would like to uh, speak to you. Those who are struggling to find joy in this season. And among you, um, among some of you are believers, uh, and yet you struggle to find joy in this season. And there are some who are overwhelmed by many concerns, you know. Uh, you try to break out of it, but yet each time, each day you wake up, you wake up to, to, to new problems, to real issues in your life. And there are maybe some among you who, have been, who are watching this online, you have not given your life to Jesus. And that is the baseline. That is the main thing. And if you try to find joy without Jesus, you are, you are trying in vain. You may have joy, but it will be temporal. It will be the joy of the world. It will be the joy that will even, it won't last. But when you have a joy in Jesus, and it is a deep-seated joy, it is a permanent joy, it is, becomes a part of your DNA. And that can only happen if you give your life to Jesus. And I want to encourage you, if you have not, if you belong to a category of not give your life to Jesus, at the end, you click on the continue button. On the screen, you'll be taken to a, a room whereby someone, a minister, will, will talk to you. Tell that person, tell that person that I, I have not given my life to Jesus. And I want to know this Jesus who's going to give me this joy. And by faith, you know, you're going to have this joy. And as I said, when you say the prayer to receive Jesus into your life, there will be a seismic shift in your spirit and in your soul, from hopelessness to new hope and new life. And talk to that person in the room, one-to-one, -one, and that person, he or she, will pray with you. And for the others, if you're struggling to find joy in this season, you're overwhelmed with many things, well, we have to learn, all have to learn, and we want to journey together with you that you will rise up above all this and really rekindle that joy and that laughter in your life, in spite of the circumstances. Now, let me be clear. The Lord may not remove all these circumstances. It may still be there. But you will be able to rise up above these circumstances because of the joy of the Lord. It's going to be your strength. 
If you belong to that category of people as well, I want you to also click that button. You will be taken to a room as well, one-to-one, -one, and talk to that person. And then that person will pray alongside with you and strengthen you in the inner core of your being to speak joy into your spirit and that you're going to be an overcomer. You're going to rise up above your circumstances. Come, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again. It's a good reminder that joy is an integral part of the DNA of what it means to be a believer. Father, as we look at the things around us, we know that there's nothing much we can really celebrate because the circumstances around us is so dark and the world is getting darker in more ways than one. But Father, we are the church. We are your people. We are the light. We are the ones that are supposed to shine brightest when the world is darkest. We are the ones who are supposed to have joy when there's despair in the world. We are the ones supposed to laugh at the work of the kingdom of darkness where they seek to kill, steal and destroy. But Lord, we are the people that comes to bring hope, to build, to bring life, to bring joy, to bring peace. We are the people that's going to be the pillar of strength for the city, for the nation right now in the time as this. Father, help us to live up to our mission, to what you have called us to do, to share the gospel, but undergirding that sharing, that mission, is really the joy of the Lord. That we, Lord, that by our persona, by our words, our deeds, our character, our disposition, when people look at us, they say that this person is different. And look at you and say, this person is different. This man, this woman is different. He, she knows the true God. Because only the true God today can really give us, make us overcomers and give us a joy to ride through this season. Thank you, Lord. I commit all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Yang Huat, for uh, the message in season. Yeah. So uh, before we uh, sing this response, I would like to... Uh, you know, if, if, if this is your first time listening to this and you have not yet believed in Christ, I would, like to reassure, I would like to assure you that that uh, only in Christ there is true joy. Only in Christ there are pleasures evermore. You know, Jesus didn't come uh, to give us a, a carefree life, you know. He, he didn't come to give us a a life uh, full of roses but in John 16 verse 33 he says take heart I have overcome the world and we can take joy in that because Jesus has overcome death he has Amen. overcome sin Amen. and he has even overcome COVID-19 Amen on. so come, come church let us uh, you know as we sing this response song let us uh, put on a crown of beauty instead of ashes the oil of gladness instead of mourning. Come on. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Come Amen, on. church. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him a shout. Hallelujah. Hey! Praise Woo! you, Lord. Thank you, God. Let's go. Two, three. Come on, clap your hands. Wherever you are. Turn it all around. You turn it all around. Where I was hurting, now I'm rejoicing. In your love, I'm found, and I have joy. Whoa! You took away my pain. You took away my pain. You turned my mourning into dancing. I can smile again as I have joy. Whoa. Let the celebration, let the celebration begin. Make a joyful noise huh, to Him. Come on, everybody, let's give Him praise for He is good. You have given me a joy that won't stop and will never. So I will praise you with gladness, for you are 
now come to the end of the service and uh, you know we would like to encourage uh, those of you who need prayer to go to the bottom right corner of the screen and click on the prayer button and you'll be taken to a zoom breakout room where someone will be assigned to you to pray for you you know thank you for joining us this morning and i'd like to leave you with a benediction may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank God bless and have a blessed week. See you next Sunday. See you, everyone. <laughs>